Our scripture lesson today comes from Mark, the 10th chapter, beginning at verse 17. As he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. He said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go sell what you own and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. When Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at these words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astonished and said to one another, Then who can be saved? And Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God all things are possible. Peter began to say to him, Look, we have left everything and followed you. And Jesus said, Truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the good news, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age of houses and brothers and sisters, mothers and children and fields with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. The word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. Our gracious God, we come to you this morning, having read a most difficult text to hear. We pray your Holy Spirit might take those holy words and, Lord, that you might speak to our hearts those eternal words of truth and life. Help us to see beyond our own contemporary meanings and help us, dear Lord, to understand once more your values. We're so thankful for the life that we have, for the blessings that have been bestowed upon us, for the comforts and joys and peace that we have in our lives, and we pray, dear God, that once more we might re might be reminded of our dependence upon you. Guide and bless us, we pray, during this time. Amen. The story of the rich young ruler is probably not one of the most favorite stories in the Bible. It's a difficult story to preach, especially in this day and age, because whenever we hear that story, we immediately think, well, it's not about me. I mean, I may have all the creature comforts of life. I may have the latest convenience, conveniences. I may have a stock portfolio. I may have a lot of things, but it's still not about me. You know, it's about the ultra-rich. It's about the one percenters. It's about those people that have more money than they know what to do with. The Bill Gates and the Donald Trump and all of that crowd. It's about them. But is it? Jesus doesn't seem to think so because he's talking to everyone. He's talking to his followers. He's talking to his disciples. He's talking to those who come out to hear him. And he's talking to them about their lives and what's important and what's unimportant. The rich young ruler comes to Jesus and asks a simple question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus goes through the litany, you know, follow the Ten Commandments, do what you've been taught to do. You know better. 
You've been taught differently. You know what to do. Do those things. Be a good person. Live a good life. Follow the commands. But I do all those things. And Jesus then comes right home and says, take your possessions and sell them. Give them to the poor and follow me. Now, we normally read here where he went away rejected, and he does. But if you read that passage of Scripture right before that, you will see where it says, and Jesus looked at him and loved him. Think about that for a moment. Jesus saw something in that young man that perhaps he didn't see in others. He saw the potential of a disciple, a follower, someone who could make a difference in the world, someone who would put his mark on the world, someone who would be more than just among the numberless, but someone that would spread the kingdom of God in a significant way. Jesus loved him and then gave him those words that he needed to sell his possessions and give to the poor and follow him. Now the difficulty with all of that is that we take it at literal face value. Is Jesus telling me to go sell everything I have and give to the poor? Well, no, because then you become poor. And then, you know, it's a, it's a cycle. So what is Jesus saying? Well, I think he's saying, because if you read the Bible, there are wealthy people in Scripture. There are wealthy followers of Christ. There are individuals who support the ministry of Paul throughout his missionary journeys, and they're wealthy people. If you look at the ministry of John Wesley, an individual who had wealth, but yet gave it all away, but it was other people that supported him and helped him and gave him the means to do what he could do. So what is Jesus saying? First of all, I think Jesus is fully aware of the world in which we live. And yes, it takes a lot of money, doesn't it? It's amazing how the cost of everything just keeps going up and up and up. And just when you think you've got it all figured out, just when you think that, oh, I'm going to be able to retire I'm going to be able to take it nice and easy. I'm going to live the good life. You find out that all the drug companies are going to, to increase their prescription prices 5,000% and all that money you thought you had, you don't have anymore. As Yogi said, a nickel ain't worth a dime anymore. And it's not. In other words... It's that, that's, it's that difficulty. It's that difficulty of learning to live in our world. And sometimes we look at the church, and I know some of you are saying, oh, the preacher's preaching about money, and you've already closed your ears, and you don't want to listen to any of this because, that's again, that's all we do. And it's not about that. I'm very sensitive to the fact that many of our families in this congregation struggle. Struggle to make ends meet struggle to have enough, and I'm very aware of that. And I never want to come to the place where I callously think, well, just everyone would do what, what I do or what someone else does would be fine. That's not it. It's what are you challenged to do? What are you doing in your heart, in your life? How are you dealing with this passage of Scripture? Not how I deal with it, but how are you dealing with it? What is, what is it saying to you? Well, I think it says a, a number of things. First, I think it says to us, don't overvalue things and undervalue people. We do that a lot, don't we? We judge people not by their character, but we judge them by their clothes and their car and where they live and what they have. We judge people a lot by the things and we're individuals that know the price of everything. I mean, 
we bargain hunt, and now if you want a hotel, you can go to this website, and they'll get, you know, a hundred different websites, and they'll monitor it all for you, and you can find the cheapest place to stay, because we all want the cheapest. We all, we're all very aware of those things. You know, we even do that with church. I've actually had people come to me and say, this church expects too much. We're going to go elsewhere. Now that's sad. Because it's not what the church is expecting, it's what God expects of us that we have to struggle with. And we need to be careful that we never come to that place where we overvalue things and undervalue people. And what happens is all of our stuff gets in the way. When I was growing up and living in a, in out in the country, we had a neighborhood, but the neighborhood was like five miles around. And you knew everybody in that five-mile radius, and you would, you would go and visit, and you knew everything that was going on. Remember the old party lines? You really knew what everything was going on because you were listening in. And it was neighborhood, and we were all poor. But what's happened over our lives? The more we have, the more we possess, the higher our standard of the neighborhood becomes, but the more isolated we become. And now many of us don't even know who our neighbors are. Our possessions have become more important than people. I've experienced this firsthand whenever I took my first missionary trip to Haiti almost 40 years ago. And I realized how blessed I was. And I'm from the Ozarks, so I mean, come on, it's relative. (laughs) How blessed I was to live the life I lived because they had nothing. And you know what the strangest thing was? They had more joy and more peace and more happiness than we'll ever have, I'm afraid. And you know, they would actually come to church and expect to stay for three hours. They expected the preacher to preach for at least an hour. You hear me way back there? (laughs) But we've lost all that because we're too concerned about our time. We've got too many things to do, too many places to go, too much stuff. Jesus is also saying to us, be aware that the possessions you have are not the ends, they're simply a means. Another way of saying that is the stuff that we have has its utility. It's not the, it's not the goal of life. What we have are objects to be used for something greater than just having the object. And yet we live in a world where the more and more possessions that we have, the more and more stuff, the more and more insurance, the more and more that we have to look over. It's amazing. And we see it all the time around us, and we don't even realize it. A few weeks ago, I was driving through Milan, and I happened to look over to a new house that was being built. And it was a, a nice size house, but I, it had six garages. Six, that's a lot of stuff. That's not what's important. But if we're not careful, it comes to where that overwhelms us. And did you read about the man a couple of months ago, the young 20-year-old Swiss man whose father would not buy him a newer car, and so he set fire to his $245,000 Ferrari? because his daddy wouldn't buy him a new one. Now, before we feel too self-righteous, did you know you could sign a phone contract right now that will make certain you have the latest iPhone every time it comes out? Possessions. That's what Jesus is trying to talk about. He's talking about the way we live our lives, the stuff in our lives. And I can't judge your stuff. Only you can with the help of God. 
And so it is that we need to realize that these things in themselves, all of these possessions, because read what the scripture says. The scripture says that the young man went, a home, went away sad and disappointed because he had many possessions. His possessions were controlling him. So how do we, how do, we do it? How do we make it? Well, we trust God. Now, I know that sounds quaint, simplistic. Just trust God. But I believe that's true. Because there's not a single one of us that can predict what can happen to our lives. And if we had a crystal ball, I hope no one would ever look into it because we can't handle what's to come within us and within our lives. We can't handle it. But we take it a day at a time and we trust in the Lord to guide and lead and provide. And we take what God has given us and we use it to build the kingdom of God. And we give joyfully, not because we have to. We give freely because we've been blessed. We give because God has done something for us and that he has changed our lives. In other words, we learn to trust in God. More than just putting that on our money. More than just putting that on your license plate. But learning to allow God to trust, to be with him, to trust him for all of our needs. And God does provide. Amen? Amen? Amen. You, I mean, we're blessed people. God provides. You should be running the aisles now. <laughs> Amen. God provides. And yet we look at ourselves as poor and undone, and we take, this, we take it in the wrong way. Now, if any of you have any stocks and investments, and I know you do, ever so often, your broker is going to call you and he's going to say, now we need to rebalance your portfolio. You've heard that phrase, if you have any, any investments. We need to rebalance your portfolio. I submit to you that that's what this passage of Scripture is all about. Jesus is saying to us, if you really want to have eternal life, if you really want to follow me, let me rebalance your life so that you can understand that people are more important than things, that all of our possessions are simply means and not the ends in themselves, and that if we will trust in God, God will provide. But we have to trust God, and we have to allow him to rebalance. And that was the secret of the Methodist church. John Wesley took a group of poor people, the poorest of the poor, the poor that the rest of the churches had already neglected and said, these people don't have anything. John Wesley took those people, and because of their rebalanced lives, because they refocused their energy on the things of God and not on the things of the world, suddenly they had more money to spend. And if you're not buying lottery tickets, if you're not buying all the other, I mean, I don't want to get too personal here. <laughs> you know, if you're not buying all that stuff, guess what? You're going to have more money. And if you've got a proper understanding of what stuff is, you'll learn that the best meal you can get in town is at the Cracker Barrel any day. Rebalancing our lives. Trusting in the Lord. Jesus loved that man. That's what scripture says. And Jesus loves us as well. The question is, what are we going to do? How are we going to respond? Can we allow God to help us rebalance our lives in a way that God can use it for the glory of God and that his kingdom will come here on earth? In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.